Gain the latest news from our experts in the field straight to your hands. Sign up for our weekly tech service where we provide quick and to the point videos. Shot on site to help you plan your planting day. Know when to scout and which diseases are present in your area. Become aware of upcoming tech and new seed options. Precisely time fungicide, insecticide, and chemical application for best financial returns, and much more. Every choice you make as a farmer matters on the field. With more information on hand, the better agronomic decisions you can make. Keeping your ROI high, yield strong, and soil healthy for the long haul. Sign up is free and easy. Simply text the word JOIN to 844-843-9247. Cancel any time by texting the word STOP. It's just that easy. No spam, just helpful information shared once a week. Stay in the know with Liquid. My name is Chuck Stout. I'm an account representative for P&K Midwest here in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Our dealership has been here since 2012, and I've been uh, working for the John Deere dealer group for 21 years. Here at P&K, we sell equipment to both homeowners, commercial construction companies, farmers, and egg service providers. Uh, the full line of John Deere equipment from homeowner equipment, lawnmowers, skid loaders, small utility tractors, all the way up to large frame agriculture equipment, self-propelled sprayers, and fertilizer applicators. We also offer a full line of uh, steel uh, equipment, as well as parts and service for all products that we sell here at P&K Midwest. Two things that make us unique at P&K Midwest are, are not only the, the full product offering that we have with John Deere products, but the parts and service that we strive to keep top notch. You can buy equipment from anywhere, but only certain dealers are gonna be able to keep you running in the heat of the battle when season is strong. What I like best about working for P&K Midwest is that we're a family owned business. It's, it's not uncommon to walk into the store and see the family members that own and operate our company, and I never feel out of place in contacting them in doing what's best for our customers. Hi, I'm Katie Hess, um, and I am the Sales and Marketing Director here at Liquid Grow. I'm Jake Boston Kemper, uh, Director of Research and Agronomy here at Liquid Grow. Thanks for joining us today. Dr. Jake, this is our third annual virtual series for the Lead Academy. Can you believe it? We've been doing this for three years now. Time flies when you're having fun, Katie. I suppose, yes. Um, over the years, we've offered some really great topics and videos for everybody, and this year I think we have a stellar lineup as well, don't you think? I absolutely do. Yeah, so one thing that's new is this this Friday we're going to do a first ever studio audience style live stream for the folks at home. So if you're interested in that soil health panel discussion, it's going to be in West Liberty on Friday. There are a few seats still available. And Katie, I'm really excited. The, the folks on the panel with myself are truly experts in soil health, cover crops, cropping management systems. It should be a nice discussion. If you want to learn about soil health and what it means to you, I, I would suggest you attend. So if you want to go ahead and register at our website, it's www.liquorgrow.com, or you can talk to one of our Liquor Grow sales reps. They can get you signed up as well, too. So like I said, we're running, we're running down to just a few more seats available for that one because it is a limited space event. A um, few things that I wanted to mention is if you could go ahead and like and subscribe our YouTube channel. That way, anytime we add something new, it goes right to your phone and you always see that little blue dot up on the channel button. You noticed in our very first video that's called the Liquid Grow Loop. It's a free text messaging service so that the video can come directly to your phone and you don't have to go out onto the web or find it on any of the social media content. Um, sites, you can just have it right to your phone as well. And um, thanks to our um, vendors that allowed us to come in and vid video at their um, places of 
places this year uh, that you noticed this last one was P and K. We have a few more that, this week and you'll be able to see that as well. So with that, let's kick off today's presentation and it is called Sulfur, When is Enough Enough? Jake, it's kind of an old topic, but... But very important. Yes, and we just keep um, tweaking how we use it and getting more bushels out of it, right? I think it's, I think it's important enough for sure. Sulfur is important enough that it's always a good idea to kind of discuss some of the practical implications and best manager practices. So after today's program, we will have a live Q&A session, and you can either put those questions that you have in the chat on YouTube, or you can send them to us at questions at liqua-grow.com, and we'll be checking that and answering those as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and start today's program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Hess, Sales and Marketing here at Liquid Grow. Today I'm with Dr. Jake Vossenkemper and our Lead Academy topic is Sulfur, When is Enough Enough? Jake, we just keep talking about sulfur year over year, so why are we still doing that? Well, Katie, all I can tell you is that I contemplated not even talking about sulfur because we should know everything about it given its importance, but yet it's the number one service call I go on uh, each and every year for at least the last three years is sulfur deficiencies in corn. That is true. I know when June 1st hits, Jake's out on service calls because um, we're talking about sulfur. So let's jump into this. We're going to talk about rate. We're going to talk about source. We're going to talk about timing and the importance of sulfur. Right, Jake? Absolutely. So, Katie, I think I think one, you know, I think there's a couple explanations of why, you know, we continue to see more and more sulfur deficiency with time. OK. So, you know, going back since about 1956, we've been increasing corn yields by two bushels per acre per year. Just incredible, really. Um, so two bushels per acre per year. Think about that for a minute. The other thing, which I think you all probably know, and I feel like I'm a broken record, but obviously since roughly the mid-1980s, the Clean Air Act mandated that we reduce sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, that has progressed from cleaning sulfur dioxide out of coal-fired power plants all the way through low sulfur diesel. You know, now we have the different different tiers of emissions control on all of our diesel engines. Sure, so we probably shouldn't talk about that today, though. All of that is geared toward continuing to lower uh, the amount of emissions, and, and what, some of those emissions are carbon dioxide. And most of our sources of sulfur, sulfur came from the air prior to that. Absolutely. So now we need to feed our crop a different way. Yeah, and for example, Katie, Back in about 1986, we were getting somewhere around 15 pounds per acre per year of sulfur. Out of the atmosphere. Out of the atmosphere. Um, today, uh, you know, we're getting somewhere around three pounds of sulfur per acre per year. That varies depending on the year and how much rain we get and blah, 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 blah. But the bottom line is we're getting, you know, almost no sulfur today where back in 1986, we were getting somewhere around that 15 pounds per acre per year. So great for the environment, but not for our corn crop, right, yes, Jake? And as correct. these yields continue to grow, it's gonna take more sulfur to feed these yields, correct? Absolutely, that's, that's, that's the name of the game, that's the message, and that's why we're seeing more and more sulfur deficiencies and larger yield increases from sulfur because we continue to reduce the amount that we're getting in the atmosphere and yields continue to go up. So when we're out there in June, um, what are we looking for for these sulfur deficiencies? Yeah, that's a great question, Katie. Uh, a lot of these service calls that, that, that I end up going on, you know, the phone call I get is, Jake, the farmer's telling me we didn't apply, we didn't apply nitrogen, um, or there's something going on yep. with nitrogen in the field, right? Mm -hmm. And I can just about predict now that when I get there, it ain't nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while it is, but most of the time, the farmer is calling sulfur deficiency, nitrogen deficiency. And when I get there, it ends up being sulfur. And the first thing you're gonna notice is generally lighter green tops, okay? With, with nitrogen, we see the yellowing start at, at the base of the plant working its way up. With sulfur, we see the yellowing start in the new growth working down from there. And that's a mobility thing, right? Nutrients sometimes move in the plant or they're Correct. immobile and don't move. In the nitrogen plant. is mobile and can be translocated from the lower leaves to the upper canopy. Sulfur is not and it cannot be translocated in the plant, and that's why the sulfur deficiency shows up in the newest growth. And oftentimes, this, it'll start, you know, where you might have somewhat normal colored upper leaves, but you'll start to see the inner veins start to turn yellow. And right. as that deepens, as the, as the nutrient deficiency intensifies, the whole top of the plant will turn yellow, and that interveinal chlorosis will just continue to get worse and worse and worse. Um, Jake, I don't wanna stop you there. Can you correct that? In season? Absolutely, yes, okay. absolutely. 
Um, you know, fertilizer, sulfur fertilizer can correct it, but also the, the, the soil will tend to mineralize more sulfur as it warms up. So right. sometimes it'll go away just from sulfur mineralization from the soil. And that may or may not mean, you know, if, if the plants recover, uh, you know, there could be no yield loss, but oftentimes if that deficiency lasts through V7, V8, it's definitely gonna reduce yields. Okay. Um, and it may reduce yields even if it doesn't last that long, but just kind of a rule of thumb is if that sulfur deficiency is still there around V7, V8, it's definitely reducing yields. Jake, we've spent some time talking about corn. Let's talk about soybeans. So we're seeing some higher yields more consistently. Is there any reason to be using sulfur in our soybean fertility management? Generally speaking, yes. Um, I have not done as much work on my own in soybean as I have corn. I've done a ton of work in sulfur and corn. I'm gonna show some yield data later, but if you just kind of look at the back of the napkin math and you look at what an 80 bushel, how much sulfur an 80 bushel soybean crop requires, the atmosphere in the soil just, you know, on average for sure cannot supply enough. So there's a nutrient, there's a sulfur balance budget uh, that should be on the screen here. And, you know, Katie, basically is what that says, if you kind of do the back of the napkin math, if you have 50 bushel soybeans and greater than 3% organic matter, you might not need sulfur, but uh, who wants 50 bushel soybeans? I mean, that's, <laughs> you, 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 you don't plan to have 50 bushel soybeans. So if you plan to have 70 to 80 bushel soybeans routinely, which is what we do, sulfur is gonna be part of that puzzle. So there are some instances where sulfur may not be required in soybean, but it's, 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 it's few. Okay, we've talked about corn, we've talked about beans. What about what type of sulfur should we possibly be using? Well, Katie, you know, there's many different types of sulfur, but the four that are most routinely available on the marketplace would be elemental sulfur, gypsum, ammonium sulfate, and ammonium thiosulfate. Now, okay. like I said, there are different forms out there, mm -hmm. but these four are the most common and widely available forms that a farmer's gonna find. So Jake, elemental sulfur, most people think about using that for like the long game, because it's not readily available, we know that. Yeah, most people do think about that for the long game, and you're right, it's not readily available. But I would also argue, uh, which is supported by scientific research, by the way, not mine, <laughs> that it's, it, the problem with elemental sulfur is twofold. It has to oxidize to sulfate sulfur, which is an extremely slow process. The other issue is, is that sulfur mineralization. So as the year goes on, the soils warm up, they get, you know, they get more moist with rain events. They tend to mineralize sulfur from the soil, from the organic matter, right? Well, it just so happens to be that those same conditions that are good for sulfur mineralization are also good for elemental sulfur oxidation. So it's what you're gonna find is that, that soil mineralization and sulfur oxidation occur at relatively the same time. So it's early in the growing season. It's the end of April, it's May, it's most of the month of June. That's when the sulfur deficiencies are out there. So if you're relying completely on elemental sulfur, you're not gonna have any early because it's not gonna start oxidizing rapidly until the soils get very warm and moist, okay? So then, you know, there's gonna be a, a given amount of it oxidized into the sulfate form, basically in the middle and toward the end of the season. Well, now you're gonna go through all winter and whatever was in the sulfate form is gonna be lost. So then so, comes next spring, and before there's any more available again, it's got to oxidize. So it, elemental sulfur oxidation is reverse of when the major crop demand is, and it's, it, it happens at the same time sulfur mineralization does. That makes total sense. So it's, it doesn't line up with the crop needs. Correct. It's showing yes. up too late to the Correct. game. Correct. Correct. Um, gypsum was the second thing you said. I've had my fair share of experiences with gypsum. Um, what was the number, what's the number one problem with it? Uh, spreadability is what we had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, was not very much. And so, and so 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we weren't seeing large consistent yield increases from sulfur, that probably wasn't as big an issue. Right? right. But today, when we're really dependent on sulfur to increase yields, it's gotta be spread uniformly. And that's just a problem. And I know there's pelletalized gypsum out there and blah, blah, blah. The other issue is, but it still can't necessarily be spread uniformly. <laughs> and the other issue is getting the stuff. Right. I have customers every year who ask for gypsum. 
And it's like, well, I can try to get you a price and our wholesale guys can't even get it. So how's a local farmer supposed to get it? Right. right? So we'll kind of brush over that one a little bit. <laughs> um, but then you've got the whole AMS versus ATS thing and it's the M versus the T, right? Yeah, so a AMS, I, I have it kind of ranked on here in my order of likability or which one I prefer. AMS isn't a bad source of sulfur. Or getting to the ones you like is what right. you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> AMS isn't a bad source of sulfur. No. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's quickly available, uh, meets the needs of the crop, um, but it's, I go back to that, it, it's, it, it's spreadability, right? You, you still have to blend it with dry fertilizer and you still have to spread it. And, and in the same vein as gypsum, now that we're really dependent on it, uniform application has become, has become even more important. Okay, so our last one, ATS, ammonium thiosulfate. Um, it's something that I was introduced to about 10, 15 years ago now. Uh, we always used it in our weed and feed up front, greened everything up, made everything look really nice. Yep. Pretty a uniform. Yes. So ATS has got all the same qualities of AMS, but you know, to your point, it can be spread uniformly, whether that's with herbicide, whether that's with liquid suspensions, uh, whether that's on the planter with starter fertilizer, not in furrow, obviously you cannot apply no, yeah, ATS in furrow. That. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Um, so there, there are a lot of it, a lot of advantages, and then also it's a nitrification inhibitor, which I was going to get in. There's some new research on that topic, and I was going to kind of get into some of the brand new research on that topic. So Jake, this is Elite Academy, and I say all year long, well, let's save that for Elite Academy. So here's your shining moment. Okay. Let's get into the weeds on sulfur. Okay, so you know, first thing I want to talk about is, you know, what what generally could you expect from a sulfur yield increase? yield increase in corn, right? So I was thinking about how to prepare for this presentation and I've just done so many different sulfur studies since I've been here. I really don't know how to best say how consistent of a response I see in sulfur because it's it's good. <laughs> but in, you know, I kind of I kind of group some experiments kind of going throughout the years and I've got about uh, five different experiments I've done and there's some I even left out but on average I see about an 8.9 bushel yield increase from 10 to 15 pounds of sulfur in corn. And it's pretty darn consistent. The old adage was, eh, if you've got three or four percent organic matter, you probably don't need sulfur. That's just not the case. I, I see yield increases as consistent, or perhaps even more consistent in heavy ground as I do light ground. So, so as a guy is doing his um, fertilizer plans, as he's doing his chemical plans, sulfur should just be on that plan as it well. It should be on that list. I wouldn't for even, corn and I, beans. I, yes, I wouldn't even think about it. I wouldn't even think about not doing it. I mean, that's that's what I see in my research plots, and I've seen it for a long time. Um, soybeans, you know, to get a little bit more in the weeds. Again, I have not investigated soybeans, uh, sulfur, and soybeans near as much. I just I I do plenty of soybean research, but I just get a lot more questions in corn than I do soybean. I just end up focusing a lot more on corn than I do soybean. But the work that I've done here at Looker Grow says about a 1.8 bushel yield increase. A yield increase from sulfur on soybean, that's about 10 pounds of sulfur that I tend to use. Are you seeing bigger increases when you get into those higher yielding environments? I mean, soybeans, you usually see stuff like that. Yeah, Katie, I would speculate that's absolutely the case. Um, so if you want high yielding beans, you probably need this gonna, on your yeah, list if, of if, things. If, in some extreme conditions, um, you know, you may not see a yield increase in soybean, but if you want 80 bushel soybeans or that's your objective or goal, it's probably got to be part of the program. Um, Brad Bernhard, uh, you know, he used to work with me quite closely. He shared some data. Uh, he's a crop scientist now with Syngenta. He shared some data with me that was, was, was done last year. And I like these multi-location, multi-state trials with lots of locations and what they basically found was about a four bushel yield increase when 20 pounds of sulfur as ammonium thiosulfate was applied with the planter. Okay. Okay. Um, so he shared, you know, that with me. I, I put the URL link on here if you want to go look at the entire publication and what they said about sulfur and so on and so forth. But they basically concluded about a four bushel yield increase. You know, I said 1.8, but my stuff is is much older. It's not near as extensive. Um, so I, I hope this all sums up in the fact that sulfur is important for soybean too. Jake, we know it works. So what rate should we be using? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Let's start on corn. Yeah, that's a great question. So I've been doing some rate studies, um, a few, and it's, uh, again, it's what the customer and the retail salesman's asking for because they believe, you know, heck, we probably need 
25 or 30 pounds of sulfur breaker. Right. It must. Oh, if some is good, it's more better. <laughs> right. And the right studies that, that I have done would suggest that corn after soybean, 15 pounds is, is about what you need to get some of these large yield increases I'm talking about. I mean, I, I haven't really seen yields go up when you do 20 or 25. You know, I, I've only done two, I've only done a rate study at two locations, but at both locations, that's basically the story. About 15, 10 to 15 pounds of sulfur was about what you needed to maximize, maximize profitability and yield, frankly, okay? And that also aligns really well with some older work done by Iowa State. So some older work done by Iowa State suggested 15 pounds of sulfur. 16 actually was the economic optimum sulfur rate in heavy soils, okay? Light soils, it was closer to 25 pounds per acre. So and if that's you have, that leachability. Yes, so if you have sandy, it's the leachability, but it's also the soil supply. How much can be mineralized from those low organic matter sandy soils, okay? So in sandier or low organic matter soils, you probably need closer to that 20 or 25 Should pounds. you be side dressing that as well, or should it all just go on in one shot? Katie, you can side dress it, but in my plots, I see much more consistent and higher yield increases from at planting or pre-plant applied sulfur than I do in season sulfur. Now, when I say in season sulfur, the trials I'm doing, I'm talking about V5 or later. These trials were all in that V5 to V9 time frame, And I think, as I mentioned earlier, if that sulfur deficiency goes until around that V8, you know, that's when I think you're taking big yield hits. Mm -hmm. So if you want to apply some in season, that's fine, but make sure you have a good chunk of that on up front or at plant. This probably isn't the right time, but since we're talking about timing too, can you put some on in the fall or do you want it all up front in the spring? So you can put some on in the fall. Um, and it goes back to that soil type, right? So if you have, you know, silty clay loam soils or silt loam soils, I think you're going to be okay in the fall. In fact, I've done some fall spring trials and I saw, you know, roughly about a two bushel yield decrease for putting sulfur on in the fall and the spring, okay? So you're definitely going to get a yield increase regardless in these heavier soils, right? Sandy soils or well-drained soils, no. Do not Keep put it, it on in the fall. In that case, you want to put it on in the spring. So sure. as long as these soils aren't well-drained, you're gonna be okay putting it on in the fall. If you have the option to put it on in the spring, sure, but you don't always have that option, okay? Okay, so corn, what about soybeans? Soybeans, uh, again, I haven't done near as much of uh, work, but you know, 10 pounds is what I have used in the studies I've done here, and that's got us that 1.8 bushel yield increase. And I just, when you start doing the math, I don't think you need more than 10 pounds in soybean. I mean, I just think that's probably enough you might even be able to get away, you know, if you're if you're trying to to watch expenditures, you might be able to get away with five and be okay. I haven't tested that, but you know, five to ten pounds is is plenty. Ten pounds is plenty. Five, I think you're still going to see the yield increase, um, but I just haven't looked at that. And I don't know a lot of people who have done rate studies in soybean. Jake, we just mentioned that ATS is your favorite um, source of sulfur. In case anybody wants to know that for trivia night, Jake's favorite source of sulfur is ATS. Um, I'm going to guess, though, that you're going to want to tell the folks why Correct. ATS yeah, and some I, of the benefits and features that, uh, that you get along with that. I am. So ATS is not only a great sulfur source, but there's a couple other things that it, it can do. And we'll start with nitrification inhibition. So when I say nitrification inhibition, what I'm really saying is... Yeah, pause. Is, what does that mean? Yes. <laughs> and nitrification inhibition is simply... The slowing of the conversion from ammonium, which is not leachable and not denitrifiable, to nitrate, which is leachable and is denitrifiable. So it keeps the nitrogen plant available in, in the a soil. Form that cannot be lost. Right. Yes. But it doesn't stop it. It just slows it down. It just it slows down. it. It okay. doesn't stop it. It just We're slows it down. Yes. Okay. Now, you know, this work was done in the early 90s at South Dakota State. Okay. So it's pretty old. And this is the only scientific published, peer-reviewed data that we have on this topic, okay? Um, and in that study, um, there were some other studies done about around that time. My point is it hasn't been looked at in a long time, okay? And in this study in particular, you know, ATS was about half as effective as, as nitropyrin, um, in this case, or instinct, at slowing nitrification. So it definitely slowed nitrification, but not as much as instinct, for example, okay? However, Katie, there's some brand new research. 
And I like ATS so much that I might be involved in it. <laughs> and Jake, the folks can probably see the slide by now. Don't get scared by the words on here. <laughs> so um, this study is being done by the University of Auburn, okay? It turns out that they have some, Dr. Galloway down there is just really good at, at, at doing laboratory work, looking at you know these types of nitrogen and sulfur transformations, okay? And so uh, they ask if I would send them some, some soil from one of my test plot sites because uh, they wanted to look at soils in Alabama and California and then the heart of the Corn Belt. So I sent them some soil from one of the plots where we do our research at, okay? And I'm just going to kind of focus on that, you know, the figures on here, the folks at home can read that, but um, what they found here is that how much ATS slows nitrification is dependent on the sulfur rate, okay? So at Roughly, I, I don't want to quote pounds because I don't know without looking at, at more at, at the paper, but the bottom line is at a lower rate, it's slowed nitrification, ATS slowed nitrification, uh, you know, roughly twice as much as the check, so without any inhibitor, right? But at the high rate, ATS was just as effective as, as DCD in slowing nitrification. Now, this is all... And DCD is? DCD is another effective nitrification, sure. nitrification inhibitor. DCD and nit nitropyrin are the two chemical compounds that are clearly effective nitrification inhibitors. All the other stuff out there on the market, so when you look at the label, if it doesn't say DCD or it doesn't say nitropyrin, it may or may not be effective. That's important, remember that. Um, and eight, so in this study, at the high rate of sulfur, ATS reduced nitrification as much as DCD, and we know DCD is effective nitrification inhibitor. Okay, now, all that said, this is early work, um, and I'm actually involved with a, a partnership with some other companies trying to verify this in the field. So in other words, does the rate of ATS have an effect on nitrification in the field? In the laboratory, it clearly does. Um, well, let's get it to the real world. Well, let's get it to the real really world happens. in the field and see what really happens. And sometimes you don't find the same thing in the field as you do in the lab. So, so what you're saying today, continue to use your instinct source um, with your ATS. Don't rely on ATS yeah. as your... For now, the approach I would take is uh, nitropyrin is effective at nitrification, and we know that. And I would use it in your biggest end load. So, you know, if, if you're putting on 130 pounds of UN at one time, that's where I would put the nitropyrin. But all these other little applications on the planter uh, with suspension fertilizer, you know, all these other little applications, that's where I would have the ATS because you're still getting some, we know for a fact, you're still getting some nitrification inhibition out of the ATS. Sure, and so you also said not to use it in furrow and you said earlier in the season is better than later in the season. Yes, so pre-plant uh, or at planting in my trials has been more effective than in season. There is one caveat to that. If, you know, it, side dressing is a bad term because what does that really mean? Uh, anytime. So, right, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're side dressing at R2 and we're side dressing when the corn's just coming out of the ground. I mean, that's a big window, right? So if it's an early side dress application, V2, V3, I think that's okay, that's fine. but. When I'm saying in season, I'm talking about V5 and later is when I haven't seen nearly as consistent or larger yield increases as putting it on up front. Okay. Okay, Katie, the last thing I would like to talk about regarding the benefits of ATS is I see this interaction between zinc and ATS that I believe is really important for getting yield increases from zinc. Okay, and there's a figure up here from a study I call my balanced nutrition study. I'll let the folks at home read it, but the bottom line is when you put the sulfur and the zinc together, you, you, you get larger yield increases when either one of them are applied independently. And there's several studies I've done here at Liquor Grow that show that same exact thing, okay? And the reason why I believe that's happening is that when ATS rapidly oxidizes the sulfate, the pH in that band drops considerably, you know, maybe as low as three in that band temporarily then it rebounds to where it normal pH is. But when that happens, zinc is much more available at low pHs than it is high pHs. So there's probably some zinc that's liberated and becomes plant available during that low pH period, and that puts a lot more plant available zinc into the soil system and allows the crop to take it up. Well, thanks, Jake, for all of that. <laughs> 
Well, thanks, Dr. Jake, for being here today. Um, all year long, I always say, well, we'll just save that for Elite Academy, and here we are, your shining moment, well, Elite Academies. Thank you for letting me get into the weeds a little bit today, Katie. It could have been worse, but I appreciate you giving me a little bit of time. Thank you. I know there at the end when he's talking about pH going up and down, I thought, oh boy, here we go. So <laughs> if you'd like to talk to Dr. Jake, you know, reach out to him through email. If you'd like to watch more of our videos, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I hope you enjoyed this week's Lead Academies. Really looking forward to Friday when we have our live in-person soil health panel where Dr. Jake and a few of his colleagues will be on to talk about soil health. Lead Academy. Liquid Grow. Excellence. And Agronomy Development. Well, thanks for watching today. And Jake, that was quite a quite a lot of information about sulfur, really. That was some good information. Yeah, could have went on, but you don't let me talk too long, so we're good. <laughs> um, so we did have a few questions come in over the email as we were sitting here, and so we'll start with some of those. Um, hopefully, I don't butcher these too much because you know I'm kind of reading them for the first time. There, there are some hybrids that we know that respond to the addition of more nitrogen. Do you think that some hybrids show the same thing for sulfur? So I think the question is, are there some hybrids that are more responsive to sulfur than others? And yes, I'm sure that's the case. Hybrids vary for the response to, to nitrogen. They vary for the response to, to uh, fungicide. And I'm sure they vary uh, to the response to sulfur. The problem, though, is that it's going to be really unpredictable. Um, and I don't know that we can use that as a management strategy to understand how much sulfur we need to or, or don't need to apply. And if you look at it like this, all hybrids need some level of sulfur, whether it's 23 pounds or 18 pounds. That's the kind of variation we're talking about. So I'm sure that exists, but it's just not a practical way to manage sulfur. And, you know, a hybrid's in the market for a good solid three or four years and it's gone. So we'd never have the chance to investigate that before a hybrid's obsolete. So having a base level of sulfur is more important than trying to hit the exact mark for each hybrid. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Um, should you put more sulfur on your sandy light soils? Yes, you should. Um, generally speaking, you know, on the sandier, lighter ground, you probably need to be more in that 20 to 25 pounds per acre versus that 15. That's kind of the standard average recommendation. Okay. Those, those soils just can't, they don't have any capacity to supply any from the soil or very little. So you need to make up the difference with fertilizer sulfur. Okay. And, and they, they tend to leach more as well. So what about your heavier, higher organic matter soils? Good, heavy ground, 15 pounds per acre as, uh, is, is enough. Um, that's what my data indicates, and that's what some older Iowa State data indicates. Um, you mentioned in the video about sulfur on soybeans. Um, when do you want the sulfur for your soybeans added to the crop? Um, at planting, pre-plant, and heavier ground in the fall is fine. Um, there, the, you got to be a little bit careful with ATS because it can, it, it, it's pretty salty. Um, you know, you don't want to wide drop it in soybean. Uh, you don't want to get too crazy on the rate, even at a with a with an outer furrow starter application. You know, probably no more than twenty pounds per acre for sure, even in a starter application. You don't want to wide drop it. Um, because it can cause injury. Now, if you have sulfur deficient soybeans um, and, and, you, and you have clearly visual symptomology, you need to find a way to put it on. You know, maybe you dribble it down the middle of the rows in uh, 30 inch rows. Um, I hate to do this, but if you have 15 inch rows, you know, even broadcasting some dry as a rescue treatment would be worthwhile. I don't, I don't physically see sulfur deficiencies in soybean in season that much, uh, with the exception of some uh, sandier ground. I've also seen it after a cereal rye cover crop has been grown. Um, so you don't see it that much, um, but if you do see it, you, you need to address it one way or the other. Oh, sure. So I think you guys will probably cover this a little bit on Friday, but you just mentioned cover crops. How about cover crops with corn? Um, I know we don't always want to do that, but do you see where you need more sulfur in that situation? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, this could, yeah, in, in brief, and if you're interested more, we'll probably get into this. Uh, watch the, the, the lead session coming up on Friday, either in person or, or the recording afterwards. But 
Um, yeah, so we know that, that you know, when, when you plant corn into cereal rye, you have to be really careful because nitrogen can be a limiting factor. So you have to make sure you keep that nitrogen in a form and positionally place it where the crop can get access to it, but the microbes aren't getting access to it to use it to de decompose that, that uh, cereal rye residue. I've done some, sul some studies this year and we found that sulfur is, is the same way. So in other words, if you're growing corn in front of cereal rye or after cereal rye, sulfur is a really, really important part of that puzzle to make sure you're maximizing corn yield. Um, so in brief, absolutely it's important and it's even more important if you're, growing cor if you're planting corn into cereal rye. Okay. Um, okay, if we use AMS in our chemical application, are we getting an, any benefit out of that? Um, some, but it's not much. So uh, if you think about it, um, if you're applying, you know, let's say you're, you're putting on 10 pounds of spray grade AMS per 100 gallons, like you might do in a glyphosate application, for example, okay? Um, if you do the math on that, I've done this before, which is why I can rattle it off, you're looking at getting about 0.48 pounds of actual sulfur per acre. Um, so it's something, but it's not much. You're going to have to have another source for sure somewhere else. So you really shouldn't rely on that. No. Maybe no. like your bonus questions and your tests in grade school, that just kind of goes to your yeah, overall grade. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the liquor girl reps <laughs> asked, uh, we've been getting lots of questions lately about AMS. Can you cover the differences between AMS and ATS again? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I am getting lots of questions from our field team on AMS, which is ammonium sulfate. It's a dry product. It's 12% nitrogen, 24% sulfur. I'm not sure where all the questions are coming from other than, you know, sulfur in general is on people's minds. There's also uh, a lot of marketing I've noticed on some different social media sites around a company that sells AMS, and I've seen quite an uptick in that marketing. Um, so I'm, nothing's changed. Uh, AMS is AMS. Um, talked about a little bit in the video, you know, AMS is a good sulfur source. It's quickly available, um, meets the needs of the crop, you know, but the one big disadvantage is it's got to be blended with dry fertilizer and that can lead to, to spreadability issues, so non-uniform applications. I've actually been on several service calls where we've seen sulfur deficiencies due to non-uniform applications, so that's, that's the only issue I see with AMS. I remember ATS, um, it's a a good sulfur source, quickly available. One of the advantages is you, you have a nice uniform application regardless of how you apply or you should anyway. Um, and there's also those nitrification inhibition effects that we talked about and then the interaction with zinc and sulfur. So AMS is a good sulfur source, but there's some added benefits to using ATS. Mainly even spread. Yeah, uniform application. For every plant. For every plant, the zinc the zinc interaction with sulfur, and the, uh, the nitrification inhibition. Okay, Jake, um, we got another one here. What is the ideal ratio of nitrogen to sulfur for corn? So I get this question a lot. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it all comes from, but there's a lot of folks who talk about an ideal ratio of nitrogen to sulfur. So in other words, if I apply uh, the, the ideal tissue ratio, there is an ideal tissue ratio, okay? And that ideal tish, tissue ratio is about seven parts of N per one part of S. So seven to so one. That's what's in the plant, that's in the leaf. That's what's in the tissue, okay? Okay. So I guess we've somehow assumed that that's, you know, the ratio of, of nitrogen to sulfur you need to apply in the field. And, and so, that, but the problem is that falls apart because you don't know what the, so, you don't know what the soil is going to supply. You don't know how much sulfur you might lose. You don't know how much nitrogen you might lose. You don't know what the, we don't know what the soil is going to supply. So there's no, re, there's no way that you can apply the ideal ratio of N to S the plant needs and expect the plant to actually end up with that because there's things in the soil that are going to happen to both that nitrogen and sulfur that you can't control. Now, I would say that if you want to take tissue tests and you're seeing routinely, maybe over a couple years, that your N to S ratio are out of whack, so they're not at approximately that 7 to 1, then maybe you need to adjust either the amount of N you're applying or the amount of sulfur you're applying to try to meet that, that tissue requirement. Okay, so it's not quite as simple as I just go out and apply, you know, nitrogen and sulfur fertilizer in this exact ratio. So back to the <laughs> back to know what you need to do and don't try to finesse it so much. Correct. Okay. Um, can we add sulfur in furrow? Um, not ATS. Um, 
there is a form of sulfur that you can apply in furrow. Mm -hmm. It's called K Ro, and uh, it's like a the syrup. Okay, like the syrup. It, it's a seed safe formulation of sulfur. Um, I'm, I've actually looked at it a little bit in the past, and I'm actually going to be looking at a lot more in plots this coming growing season. Um, you know, I think it's a, a, a fine source of sulfur. The problem is, is you just can't put on all that much in furrow, not because it's not seed safe, it's just the way the fertilizer is formulated, the concentration of that just isn't that much. Um, so you'll still need a second You're going to need probably. some other sulfur from somewhere else is the bottom line. Okay, so what about 2x2 two two or any other out of furrow? Yeah, you can put on ATS 2x2. Two two. Um, you got to be a little bit careful. You know, 20, 25 pounds per acre in corn, as long as it's truly 2x2, two two, is it going to be a problem? You know, but don't try to put on 40 or 50 pounds per acre of sulfur as ATS because it has a high salt concentration. Soybeans, you got to even be more careful. Um, probably a maximum of 20 pounds per acre. Um, I think even, and I don't think you ever really need 20 pounds per acre in soybean of actual sulfur. So as long as you keep it under that 10 pounds per acre, uh, two by two in soybean, which I know is pretty rare, but the question got answered, I think you'll be fine. Okay. Um, the last one that I have here, so if you've got any other questions, go ahead and get those entered into our chat or sent to the email. We've been pulling them through here. Um, primarily through the email is where we're getting them. Can I get sulfur delivered to my farm? I spray all of my own corn and soybeans. You can get sulfur delivered to your farm. Uh, you know, you got to have sufficient storage to store enough of it. Um, the other issue is, is that it will salt out. So we have it in tanks with heaters in the tanks. So we're talking about a million gallon tanks. So uh, my understanding is one of these tanks actually has a heater in it. Uh, the other one is painted dark green or black to keep the fertilizer warm over the winter. Even then, you still have some salt out, but these tanks are large enough that we can, you know, we can stir, stir them up for a long time in the spring and get all that sulfur back into solution. So, you know, it's not going to be something we're going to deliver in March. It's going to be something we're going to, you know, deliver in the middle of April maybe. So, it's going to be a time crunch. My, my suggestion would be let's do a hot load. Um, so in other words, you know, we can mix the ATS in with chemical at one of our facilities. That would be the best solution. There's also some things you have to be careful with regarding herbicide and ATS um, compatibility. And we know what herbicides are and are not compatible. You may or may not know, and it can be a little bit challenging. Um, but as long as you know what you're doing, you're okay. And I know we know what we're doing, so my advice would be probably do hot loads at one of our facilities. Not that it couldn't be delivered to your farm. It's just we're going to have to talk about some of the logistics involved and the do's and don'ts regarding herbicide compatibility. Okay, well, I think that kind of rounds out our question and answer for today. Thank you for joining us. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., we'll be back here, and we'll be having a program on exact strips and banding placement. Um, I know that you guys said the world record was just broken for bushels, and that farmer said he, pre he likes to have the banded nutrients, right? He I just butchered he, that probably. Yeah, well, we have to be careful <laughs> with all these world record holders, but yes, he said that he's went away from broadcast and went to all banded nutrients. So that's his personal preference, and we're going to talk tomorrow about, you know, why that might be a good idea. So that'll be on at 9 a.m., and don't forget, if you do want to join us in person on Friday at the live panel for the soil health discussion, you can do that through our Liquor Grow sales reps or through our website, www.liquorgrow.com. And if you can hit the like and subscribe button, we'd appreciate that. Thanks and have a nice day.